In my more than 20 years of teaching mathematics, I'm always amazed why some students seem to be very natural in mathematics. Here are the seven reasons I found out that gave these students unfair advantages over the average students. From a single-celled bacteria to the giant giraffe, diversity is the story of life. Its creature possesses unfair advantages over the others by the way he is built, thinks, works, socializes, and strategizes. The same is true in learning mathematics. The first one is superior math students think visually. For example, if a student is given this equation, the square of a plus b is equal to a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, many students would proceed to memorizing this formula. Well, there's no problem with that if you are only memorizing one formula. But if you are given a bunch of formulas like this, let's say we have 22 formulas containing letters A and B, chances are you would be very confused. Now, if you approach math visually, this formula would look like this. You have a square, the side length of the square is A plus B, and the square is broken down into four parts. You have this pink square, the area of that is A squared. Then you have this smaller yellow square with an area of B squared. And you have two rectangles, each with an area of A times B. So connecting that with our formula, this exponent 2, which we read as squared, means you have a square. In the square has a side length of A plus B, which is now this A plus B here, A plus B here. That is equal to these four distinct parts. The first part is this pink square with an area of A squared. The other part is this yellow square with an area of B squared. And then you have two rectangles with an area of AB. And so AB plus AB is equal to 2AB. So if you look at this formula in terms of visualization like this, you would come to realize that this equation talks about a universal truth about space. And since much of engineering deals with computations in space, then this formula we know would be very crucial in the fields of engineering. Now let's say we are given this formula. The plus sign is now changed with minus sign and your teacher says you are going to change this also to minus sign. Well you can remember that but why is that so? So let's look at the visualization again. Again we start with a square with a side length of a units. So a times a is a squared that is the area of the screen square. Now since here the side length of the square is a minus b that means you are going to subtract some quantity of magnitude b from this side length of a and let's do that so this is now our result the a minus b squared would now be this blue square the length of this blue square is a deducted by this b so this square of a minus b therefore talks about the area of this blue square and looking at now the composition of our squares and rectangles here here is what we found the square of a minus b that means the area of this blue square cannot be computed this way you start with a green square with an area of a squared but we are going to deduct the area of this rectangle which is minus a b and the area also of this other rectangle at the bottom which is again negative a b but wait a minute notice that we counted this area twice because that's already computed in the first rectangle and that's computed again in the second rectangle so we need to return back this part that was counted twice and so we need to add that part that was subtracted twice and we now have this plus b squared and simplifying this we arrive at a squared minus 2ab plus b squared which is now this right side of the equation now a better way of looking at this is you can see how these components are interrelated you can see that this part was indeed counted twice so if we remove that we now have this figure now here's another idea according to research seven percent of communication is in the form of words and the rest in the form of voice and non-verbal communication so if you are the student that rely heavily on memorizing in words these formulas you are missing a lot of opportunities to be at par with the more superior students using math visualization now the good thing about mathematics is that once you establish that something is true then you can just use the concept of substitution to apply the formula in specific instances for example in this formula it doesn't matter whether i use a or b or i use letters x or y if i replace a by x and b by y then this formula is still true in fact i can even replace this a by a binomial x plus 2 and still the formula 
applies and that becomes like this notice that this part is just substitution i did not perform any computations i just apply the formula by substituting this x plus 2 to a and only in this last two steps when i perform some minor computation to come up with the final answer. So contrary to most belief, math is not just about computation. Math is a way of thinking. Math is the language of the universe. And if you think of mathematics just as purely computation, you are thinking of math as just arithmetic. And computers can perform these tasks much better than human beings. So in mathematics, we are not so much about computation. We are after learning this universal truth about the universe that's stated in mathematical language. Let's now proceed to our idea number two. Mathematics is interconnected. Let's say we have this simple addition of fraction problem. 1 over 8 plus 3 over 8. So we add the numerators and we copy the common denominator and reduce to lowest term. That is the rule for addition of fractions. Now, what if we have 1 over 10 plus 1 over 5? Some students would think, oh, this is different. These are similar fractions, these are the similar fractions, and therefore, I'm going to think of a different rule in order to answer problem number two. And so, you go to your notes, and you study what's the next rule. But the truth is, there is only one rule for addition of fraction. The rule is, you add the numerators, you copy the common denominator, and then you reduce the lowest term if possible. In our second example, the problem is the denominators are different. What we need is a way for us to make the denominators similar. We are not looking for a different rule. We are looking for a way to re-express one of these fractions so that they can have the same denominator. And we know that 1 over 5 is the same as 2 over 10, where 1 over 5 is the lowest term, 2 over 10 is one of the higher terms. And once 1 over 5 is now re-expressed as 2 over 10, then we apply the same rule. We add the numerators, we copy the common denominator, and reduce the lowest term if possible. Everything is interconnected. When there's a slight change in the way some problems are presented, we do not search for a new rule. We just find a way to change the form, re-express some numbers so that they fit the known rules. And therefore, if we now have these polynomials, x over 10 plus x plus 1 over 10, we do not search for another rule. What we did is apply the same rule for addition of fractions. We add the numerators and we copy the common denominator. The same is true when you add radical numbers. 2 squared of 3 over 10 plus 3 squared of 3 over 10. You do not search for a different rule. You apply the same rule for addition of fractions. You add the numerators, you copy the common denominator and reduce to lowest term. That is what we mean by mathematics as interconnected. In fact, in mathematics, you have all these fundamental operations. The last two are operations in calculus, and we perform these operations to different objects, from counting numbers to integers, fractions, radicals, real numbers, complex numbers, polynomials, functions, groups, and fields. The same fundamental operations applied from a simpler set of counting numbers to the more complex set of numbers and to even complicated concepts such as functions, groups, and fields. Now notice that differentiation and integration are calculus operations. If I apply differentiation to complex numbers, then definitely that's very, very difficult. But if I differentiate simple polynomials or simple linear equations or constants, then even a fifth grader or a middle schooler can learn calculus operations. So what makes mathematics difficult is to what set of numbers are you performing the operations. And that's the reason why in order to gain some maturity in mathematics, you need a lot of prerequisite topics. But this mind mapping is very liberating because it's like you are in a mall. You are lost and you go to the directory and then suddenly you can see the arrow. You are here. That relieves you of so much mental baggage so that you can just focus on the job at hand. This brings us to another idea. Superior math students think in terms of verbs, nouns, constants, and variables. As we have shown already, these are the verbs in mathematics. You add, you subtract, you multiply, you divide, you raise to a power, you factor, you differentiate, you integrate, or you can perform that multiplication and so on. And there are not many of them, only that you are going to apply these verbs to a lot of nouns. And so you need to study the characteristics of each of these groups. To make this more concrete, when you have the equation y equals mx plus b, 
we know that that is a line. When you have y equals ax squared plus bx plus c form, that is a parabola. When we have y equals cosine x, we know its graph is a wave. And so you look at this as different objects like your dog, your cat, your house, a river, and so on. And you study the characteristics of each of these objects. For example, in this parabola, you can think of this as a profit function. When you start your business, you are at the negative. You have some fixed cost and you have no revenue. Then at certain point, you break even. And then at certain point, you reach the highest possible profit. And then after that, even if you create more products, the profit is declining. So mathematically, you can now compute what should be your input x so that you can maximize your profit. Now, look at this y equals cosine x. This can model sound wave. This can model light wave. This can model electricity. Now, let's proceed to another idea. Superior math students use systems for doing mathematics. For example, when they are studying trigonometric functions, they can form this system in order to remember exact values values of trigonometric functions. We have a video discussing this trigonometric hand tricks. This super hexagon also can be a system that you can use in order to memorize more than 40 trigonometric identities. Or you can use simulation to understand the shape of a normal curve. Or you can use diagrams and tables to systematically analyze word problems. Or you can even use whatever objects are near you to model mathematics. In here, I use rice in order to demonstrate the relationship between the volume of a cylinder and the cone of the same base area. Now let's proceed to idea number five. Superior students simplify unfamiliar problems to simpler and familiar ones. For example, this equation is what we call as quadratic equation. When one is given this more complex equation, they would try to simplify that into something that is familiar. By applying two additional steps, this more complicated equation can be reduced to an equation similar to the first one. And since this is a familiar quadratic equation, then you can easily solve this complicated equation. That is the pattern of thinking when we are solving math problems. Anything that seems to be so complicated, try to reduce them to something that is more familiar. And here is our idea number four the freedom to commit mistakes. According to this article from NPR, even the genius Albert Einstein committed a lot of mathematical mistakes. For example, faced with evidence that the universe was growing, Einstein apparently wanted to figure out why it wasn't filling up with empty space. So he came up with a proposal that is, new matter showed up to fill the gaps in the universe. New stars and galaxies would just pop up according to Einstein's model. And based on Einstein's mathematical computation, the number made sense. But it was discovered that he made a costly mathematical mistake. In the middle of a complicated calculation, he wrote a minus sign where it should have been positive. And later on, he eventually caught the mistake and he never published these results. In fact, according to Mario Livio, an astrophysicist at the Space Telescope Science Institute, about 20% of Einstein's paper contained various mistakes of various degrees. Imagine 20% error. And these are not problem sets or homework. These are mathematical publications with a rate of 20% error. And aside from that, Darwin got the evolution right, but his ideas on how individual traits were inherited turned out to be way off. And this manuscript lives as a reminder that to be great, you don't always have to be right. Let's proceed to the seventh idea. Superior math students read about history of mathematics. For example, this concept of imaginary number is always controversial in mathematics. The famous mathematician René Descartes came up with a term imaginary to represent expression that required the square root of a negative number. And he coined this term imaginary as a derogatory term since most people saw the use of these numbers as being useless. But fast forward to present day mathematics, this imaginary number has so much applications in the field of engineering. And so when I created a video on an imaginary number raised to an imaginary number, many are intrigued. How can you raise an imaginary number to another imaginary number? Well, we have a different understanding of the word imaginary in imaginary number compared to the imaginary as it is used in English language. And by knowing the history of imaginary number, then we will not be surprised to know that an imaginary number can also be raised to another imaginary number and the result is a real number. Thank you very much and we hope to see you again in our next video. Bye for now.